beautiful day. The registry is growing. Everything's going well. We got somebody new on the line, Brian Austin from Steadfast Staffords. Tell us about yourself, man. What do you do? Hey, uh, well, I've been involved with, with dogs my whole life, and I just, I'm passionate about it. And um, I'm, um, I, breed Staffordshire Bull Terriers for, uh, you know, it kind of started for myself, uh, just, uh, found a breed that I, I love and, uh, and, and kind of, you know, um, you know, went from there I, early on, I, uh, was always kind of into, into working dogs, you know, um, as a kid, you know, we were into the bird dogs and stuff. We did a lot of hunting and, and everything. Um, and I might say we a lot, but I have a twin brother. So, you know, he was always kind of my sidekick and we, we always got into trouble and, and got into things together. And, and dogs was just one of those things that we got into. I gotcha. So what, what made you choose the, uh, the Staffy Bull? You know, uh, I was raised, my, my dad always had, uh, had pit bulls when we were born, you know, we, we loved them. And, um, I, I got my first pit bull probably, uh, I, I don't know. I, I think I was probably like six or seven. I, I remember, you know, uh, my dad said, Hey, your boys want, you know, of course we were always begging for a pup, but he said that, uh, he knew where a litter was, uh, his, a gentleman he worked with bred them and so they were game bred pits and he said you want one so we went and we each got us one as the greatest day i remember driving home in the back of the truck uh with the puppies you know that's what you did back then and uh you know got home and got the water hose out and we washed our puppies you know it was great uh and so you know i just fascinated with tough dogs and with just uh really uh the, the baddest of the baddest i guess dogs i don't know uh and then so just researched and any book we could get any book I could find I would read and, and, and study and I always saw the Stavish Bull Terrier in them and uh, it always fascinated me but I just didn't know where in the world you'd get one right. well, fast forward you know my whole life uh, had dogs um, had you know started with pit bulls and had uh, an am staff uh loved it and i worked at a, an animal hospital um I actually volunteered after school the school bus would drop me off and uh i would help out there and, and a severable terrier came in i was like whoa this is you know this is the this is Staffordshire Bull Terrier. I've read about this, you know, and asked them, where did you get this from? And they said a gentleman in, in South Georgia, you know, it was in the uh, Atlanta Classifieds. And that's where, you know, the newspaper was where you got a lot of puppies from back then. And so uh, it was probably every day or every Sunday the paper came out and I looked through it, you know, and seen if there was an ad in it. And, and finally there was one. And so um, my, my dad drove us down there to get it and, and we picked out our first you know establishable terrier and it was you know that was the my my dog from then on you know i just i, I loved it I, I was around so many dogs you know just working at an animal hospital i saw a lot come in and out and and it, it was really awesome to be able to they um we uh kenneled a lot of dogs as well so they did boarding and so just got to spend a lot of times with different breeds but the Savage Bull Terrier's temperament just everything just fit you know the shorter coat just uh the toughness not too big not too small you know all that just fit and um anyway so I got into those you know I had a couple growing up and then uh, I was going to get another puppy from uh, the breeder uh, intrepid staffs in, in uh, macon georgia and um unfortunately um he, he passed away um uh, unexpectedly and um i wasn't be able to uh, to get the puppy that we were going to get um but in, in this time i would go down and visit him a lot i just like i said passionate about the dogs and would as well as my brother would go down and if we got you know free front line or heart guard or whatever it was from the drug reps and stuff where we uh, at the animal hospital we'd bring them down and kind of you know um give it to him and, and just hang around and and check you know check out the dogs and, and talk dogs with them and stuff even you know when we first got our driver's license and anyways we made made friends with his son uh and there was one last stud that he had on his yard and um 
we acquired it. He said, you know, I tell you, all, well, my, my father passed away. Y- y'all boys always came down and was good, good to him. And, um, you know, everybody else came and they were looking for a free dog or a handout. And he said, y'all were just willing to help out. So uh, what if I, I gave you all this dog? So it was um, his last stud. And, and he said, I think he'd want you to have it. So we took him and we shown him and got his uh, show championship. And it was funny because the breeder um he always can always said you know it's a lot of politics in it and uh, i didn't understand it until we actually got thrown in there because got a lot of hate and got a lot of um you know people thinking they they should have gotten that dog and, and not uh two young kids you know so we had we had kind of got thrown into it right at you know the top of the hate list early on <laughs> and uh it was you know and and that kind of started we started looking for another dog just to have and the breeders man for one you know i guess I always grew up you know uh, i don't know maybe over not overthinking but just looking into things a little differently than some people but you know the people were why do you breed this that they had no reason for it they just bred to be breeding types and then they had <clears throat> contracts they wanted you to sign and if you weren't willing to do X, Y, and Z, then they wouldn't sell you one. And it wasn't about, are you going to give it a good home? And, you know, uh, what kind of activities you did? It was more, um, you come up with the money and sign this contract and, and, and do this for me and that for me, and then you can have it. So really put a bad taste in our mouth. And we had, you know, several dogs amongst us. And we said, you know what, forget it. We'll, we'll just have a litter when we want to, you know, have a puppy from it. So we did that and it's it's now it's probably been over about 25 years now of just selecting and breeding our own bloodline and our own stock uh, of dogs to uh to what type of dog that we you know we like and what i found now it's it's kind of a dying breed literally it's um people say i'm preserving the breed now because which I, I see it, you know, and, th- and then they try to say, oh, you know, your dogs are athletic Staffordshire Terriers or they're the sporting Staffordshire Terriers and, and all this stuff. And I see it as they're just the Staffordshire Terrier that I grew to love, you know, 25 years ago. But it's changed so um, so drastically, the you know, the, the health and the function and stuff of the dog. It's just it's not there anymore. I've had people come over and look at my dogs that don't even know me or run into them and they're like what is this and i tell them and they're like uh, oh wait a minute you know this is an establishable terrier i was at a dog show last week you know you're the, the muzzle's too long and and it's um not wide enough chest on it and the bone's not big enough and this and that and yeah. just ridiculous you know they don't know what a establishable terrier is and 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 now that kind of they're pushing you know more uh, of that type and to where people have forgotten what the real savageable terrier is uh and that's what i fell in love with it's for me it's always was a smaller version of pit bull and right and what with that being said of, go ahead with that being said what is the uh average weight for your dogs you know it it varies but uh typically you know, uh, like the females are a little bit smaller, the males are a little bit bigger. Um, it's it's around twenty four pounds to um, to thirty four pounds the females, and then the males are uh, thirty eight pounds to thirty nine pounds, like forty pounds. And um, you know, and that it varies. Uh, I think a, a lot of times, I think the original standard was bred more in, in condition as well, and a lot of people. You know, I see fifty-pound dogs now and stuff. Um, they're just they're just fat and overweight. They really should be more in you know thirty-nine pounds range. But uh, right. but yeah, so they're not a huge dog. Um, but the longer I got into the breed and the more I studied it and and, and talked to the old timers, it's really a, a bloodline. And and so many times the kennel club comes in and changes things up to where you know people are more more likely to breed to a, a look than, it, than a, a dog and by that i mean you know and, and i i was real strict early on you know i had i i 
I was super picky. I had, a, and, and I think that's why I'm, I'm lucky now. I have a lot of good dogs because I, I got rid of a lot that didn't make the grade and I had high standards early on and I stuck to them. But, um, but saying that, you know, sometimes you might get one that's a little bit bigger, you know, or, or whatever the situation is. Uh, maybe the ears are standing up. Not exactly in the standard, but if, you know, the dog with the correct ears, uh, the temperament not, might not be spot on or, the, you know, whatever the situation is. And I see it time and time again where, um, the, the, you know, a person just be breeding for look, they're going to, okay, well, this color or this you know, a uh, prettier dog, even though it might have skin issues or it might have, you know, a uh, temperament, it's not as good or the drive's not there or whatever else it is. And, uh, they select a- away from it. So I'm try I try not to be, you know, ignorant of that and be mindful of it and select on what's the best dog, you know, and, and I have, you know, criteria I try to go through in my head and try to pick, you know, what's important to me, you know, and a Savage Bull Terrier to me is, is going to be uh, uh, a dog that's, you know, um, a bold dog, you know, he's going to be, um, I, I prefer mine confident, I don't like a cocky dog, you know, and, and again, there's all different kinds, and I think that's the beauty of the Savage Bull Terrier, when it was created, there were so many, you know, um, phenotypes and stuff out there and i say so many but there was a range so whether it was for what job purpose they had you know whether it was badgers you know pulling a badger out or uh, foxes or you know uh, maybe more ratting or you know the they had some for the pit and so whatever that dog's uh job was you know they kind of selected for that and and so it's a beauty to have a little bit of variety for the breed and and they're trying to cookie cutter it you know to make this stamp of a dog um it it seems you know that's uh, i think form follows function and if the dog doesn't can't function properly then you need to reevaluate what it's you know what the type is and what what it's looking like Mm. absolutely so they refer to your dogs as the more athletic type, which I love personally. But uh, what are some of the things you like to do with them? Well, for me, um, I, and, and that's where I try to get, um, you know, I am picky about my breeding program. Like, uh, I do want, um, I, I don't just, you know, I, I don't just let things slide for some, you know, as far as the breeding side of it. And, and you know, the Savage Bull Terrier, in, in my opinion, should should adore humans, interaction, love people, you know. They can be dog aggressive. That's something, that's just part of the breed. And I tell everybody, you got to be responsible. Uh, now, I, I, let's go back to, like, I, I like a confident dog, not a cocky dog that's just trying to pick fights. But if it, you know, you still got to be responsible. I don't take mine to dog parks and let them, you know, do whatever. So uh, I'm, I'm, you know, anybody to acquire one of these dogs. And I've heard it so many times. Oh, my dog this, my dog's great. It can get along. And then suddenly somebody has an accident because the owner is irresponsible. Mm-hmm. But um, for my dogs, you know, they, they need to show the, the compassion and love for, for my kids. For my for people in general, that's important to me, and um, I like you know intelligence and and just a number of other things. Um, I I have a, a, a small horse farm where I, I keep horses and stuff. And uh, one thing we have you know rats are everywhere. Uh, they will take care of the, the the rat problem and stuff that I have. And then um, I also uh, in North Georgia we have groundhogs and. I know a lot of people, you know, get upset about this, but they will, they will actually come onto my property, my pastures, and they'll dig holes. And uh, it's a big no-no with horses. I mean, a horse falls in a hole and breaks its leg, and, and it's over. You know, for a rodent that's digging holes in, in the pasture. And I, so uh, the dogs' the jobs are to take care of the uh, any of the groundhogs. You know, if if uh, and, and we got a lot of them, and they come in smells. But when they move into the pasture areas, it's free game, and I get my dogs, and they need to be able to to dispatch of them really quickly. And uh, and not be scared of them or, or anything like that. And then I also um, go hog hunting with them. So I'll 
take my dogs and and I do like a, a series of, of I guess you could say tests with my dogs to see before I even breed them if they're up to par with that and uh, they need to be able to uh, catch a hog and hold on to it and you know I see there's a lot of people that have misconception about it and and they ask me you know they call me they might want a, a hog dog or they might want this or that I'm not I'm not really per se selling the you know or, or uh, uh, breeding these hog dogs per se i'm using it as a, as a tool to see you know is it going for the smallest piglet you know you'd be surprised what a dog will do and if you just watch them you can learn a lot or are they going for the biggest one you know uh are they getting hit and then ducking and tucking tail and running you know are they uh i mean there's so much you can you can tell by it you know it's um i've had them where we've tracked hogs and stuff but in general man we really just um, you know, th this day and age, it's great. We got technology and stuff. And so we set up cameras and, and, and if we know where the hogs are and we drive around, you know, and, and um, I know where and the hogs are pretty, you know, they're not scared of much. So a lot of times they just stay around and um, I'll throw the dogs out the back of the truck and they'll uh, go for the hogs and grab a hold of one and, and hold on until uh till we can get up to it and, and dispatch the hog you know and uh, that's just another way of kind of evaluating the dog and seeing how how it performs and if it has that tough you know personality and that uh that boldness that just tenacity and and uh, no fear type uh, mentality that uh that i look for and uh that's that's one of the things i like to do again i don't you know, you have to be careful. Uh, they can get hurt. And I'm not saying that that's like the ultimate test or anything because, uh, you know, it's a lot can go wrong quick. And, and it doesn't mean a dog is, um, you know, uh, the, the greatest in the world because it catches a hog. But it does show me a lot, you know, more than uh, than the average. And, and I've had them go where they will tuck tail and run and don't want no part of it, you know. And, and I've seen the ones that were all, you know, bark and just, you know, chomping at the bit. And you would think, oh, man, this guy's going to do great. And But until you check it out, you, you really just don't know. And um, – so each one of my dogs, I try to, you know, go through this uh, this process, you know, of evaluating them and see if they make the grade to uh, to be able to be bred and and you know move the forward uh, to the future of uh, my bloodline. Very nice, and that's uh, that's awesome. I didn't know that people even used staffy bulls for hog work. Yeah, Ooh. it's. Um, you know, I don't use uh, bay dogs or anything like that. You know, I don't go crazy with it. I have, you know, they miss a hold. Uh, sometimes I'm in the woods for several hours. We're tracking them down and stuff, and we'll, uh, they can still track. I have some, I have a cousin in, in, in Florida that uh, does deer tracking with his. My, my brother had a, uh, another, I have a younger brother. He, um, he had one he trained for tracking deer you know blood blood track uh and they would find animals that we wounded or shot or whatever as well which was great you know so uh so they'll, they'll do just about anything they got amazing noses and stuff but uh but yeah we'll, we'll take them out and it's uh they really do a good job you'd be surprised you know uh, that's where the the size you know I, I try to take my more larger size dogs out. I, I found like 30, probably 35 to 40 pound range, uh, do a good job with that. And, uh, and, and I try to, you know, again, you have the, the dog aggression that you, you still have to be mindful of. And a lot of hog hunters don't like it, but I will take like a male and a female team up. And, and every now and then if I got, um, uh, you know, if there's enough hogs, I'll, I'll let a couple go. They'll get holds, and then I might throw a third out. You know, whether and it depends which ones I know get along better or whatever, and they'll go for the hog and stuff. They won't fight over it. But uh, in, in general, I don't let them just two males or two females roam together too long. And there's always exceptions, you know, and, and some of them do seem to get along fine, but I just don't want to. You know, I've been around this breed enough. I just don't want any accidents, so uh, I manage them. You know, usually a male and a female pair together, and and let them catch that way in track. Mm. So how is um? Well, you're in Georgia, so it, I imagine there's not much of a winter. But how do they um? How do they do as far as heat tolerance? 
they do good and, and surprising enough man it, get, it gets cold here um it gets you know the um <coughs> single digits of sevens and it snows and you know which i i'm originally from florida so i don't like all that but it's it's seasonal and it gets you know they call it hot atlanta we're, we're not too far from atlanta either uh for a reason um and that's another thing you know i'm glad you touched on they do well um again you got to be a responsible owner but um i have you know i i I keep them outside you know i i rotate what i usually do is i'll bring a couple in for a month at a time you know maybe a couple weeks it just depends and then i rotate and then they you know they'll go back out in their kennel and they have you know a dog house and everything um and of course when it's when it's seven degrees out i bring them in i think they'd be fine out there you know but um in general it's just too cold and but as far as the summer they're out no problem if it's 105 six degrees or whatever um they 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 love water so i'll keep usually i always keep water with them but i'm like uh, big uh, brown buckets for them to uh or I guess troughs, like horse troughs, and they'll mm-hmm. jump in and cool off. Um, I find them when they run the pastures and stuff. It's funny. I gotta be careful. I'll clean all my horse water uh, buckets, and um, one in particular I got. She'll she just jumps right in it, and she'll just swim in it and uh, get it all muddy right after I get it clean. <laughs> They're they got character, you know. They all have their own little personality. They're mm-hmm. very cool, but no, they do they do really well. But now saying. A, a typical Staverster Bull Terrier today, like if you just went out and got from from a show line, I don't think they would last five minutes, man. They, you know, people they'll say, "Oh, well, I have all my health tests," you know, because they have genetic testing, which I do on all my dogs. But they have this. But my thing is, it's more than that. It's not about if your dog is, you know, isn't a, uh, you know, doesn't carry the, the genetic mutation for whatever. It's can it actually breathe? Can it? you know, run with a ball back and go, oh, well, I've done lure coursing with my dog and I've done this and that, but I mean, no offense, a three-legged dog can run up and down a course, you know, that doesn't <laughs> mean it's the best of, uh, it's, you know, the best of the breed. So, uh, you got to kind of take that in consideration, but I got all my, my bloodline kind of originated from the, Actually, it's pretty interesting how how I have basically a lot of the old Irish Staffordshire Bull Terrier working lines in my dogs. From the 50s, a lot of the uh, game dog men like Pete Sparks and um, Joe Ordays, Al Brown, they... They kind of was curious about the Savage Bull Terrier. They, you know, and a lot of the American Pit Bull Terrier dogs originated from Irish and English imports, right? So Mm -hmm. in the 50s and and 60s and stuff... uh, and in seventies too, they, they imported from Ireland these working Staffordshire Bull Terriers, and my dogs actually origin go all the way back to the foundation. Dogs are from uh, from Joe Ordays and Pete Sparks and stuff. And uh, when they imported, now they their plan were just to cross them in with their their pit bulls and make game dogs from them, and that's what they did. But they were also uh, Steve Stone was one of the founders of the Staffordshire Bull Terrier in the United States, and. He came from Finland, but he uh, he did a lot for the breed. And one thing that he did, as soon as they came over, um, he made sure that he kept records of the, the breedings and registered them and everything. And Because uh, early on, they were actually registered. This is another interesting people don't understand and don't know enough about the breed. They were uh, registered on the pit bull registries as uh, American pit bull terriers. And then in quotations, I have pedigrees that go back to this, you know, that I was given. And they say Stavish Bull Terrier in the corner, or they have an asterisk, you know, uh, with them. And because that was the only way they could, they, they, the American Kennel Club wasn't founded then. But Steve Stone uh, did his part to make sure the records were kept while he was in the works of getting the AKC to the United or, or, uh, the kennel recognized by the American Kennel Club. And, um, and then there were a handful of purists that kept the blood in the Savage Bull Terrier going. Um, you know, one of them was Dynamite Kennels. Um, there was a few others, in- Intrepid Kennels. And so they used these Savage Bull Terriers from, from Pete and Joe and, and, and others. And uh, 
you know, so it's kind of neat. But these these dogmen also, you know, they kept them just like they did their game dogs, you know, on chains. And they were, you know, come winter, summer, 110 degrees to 5 degrees, they were out in, a, you know, a dog barrel or dog house, right? Mm-hmm. So they kind of weeded out the bad ones. And, uh, and, and same with, you know, other health issues. If they weren't tough enough to live off of old Roy, you know, or whatever it was, they just didn't make it. So the, the, these, you know, foo-foo dogs now that they got to have these $200 bag of dog food, they got to have you know, or, or mix raw and this and that, you know, the, my dogs fortunately can, you know, on, on the minimalist stuff can survive. And they did me a favor. They, they weeded out the bad stuff. I really believe. And then even mothers, I, I only will keep a female if it's a good mom. People don't talk about it a lot, but there's a lot of out there that either a they need C sections, which is not shouldn't be part of the breed, and then mm. uh, B there uh, a lot of them out there that just uh, can't survive. You know, have breathing problems, or the mamas are just bad mamas, and they're eating and killing <clears throat> the babies, and and so on and so forth. And and uh, again, if they happened on these dogmen's yard, they would just get rid of them. They would say, "Come and get this dog," or they you know get rid of it themselves. So uh, they they just selected to great mothers, you know, dogs that were capable of living in extreme, you know, temperatures, you know, as far as uh, heat and, and and even the cold, uh, really. And, and now that, you know, you can't keep as many dogs, you know, it's just not practical nowadays and there's no reason for it uh but i i was able to take the best of you know select the best bloodline that i could or the best dogs from what some of these older gentlemen uh real-time dogmen had you know it was a big thing early on in the south for me um was uh these game dog men that had establishable terriers and it was kind of a novelty type thing they bred them just because they that you know uh, they appreciated them and stuff uh and i was able to get my dogs from uh some of these men and keep the bloodline you know going on and there's not a lot out there about the history in the united states uh of it because and just like every other breed it's so easy where you know, at one time, man, you could go anywhere and you could find, like, I knew a lot of men that just kind of kept them, you know, and they kept it themselves. They didn't do Facebook. They didn't do the computers. They didn't do none of that stuff. And uh, now they've either passed away or just gotten too old. Uh, or, you know, the ones that did carry this bloodline, um, you know, for whatever reason, it just died out. Or they, they, you know, new is always better. People import the newest thing, and before you know it, they wash out the old bloodlines, and it's it's gone. You know, mm. so I'm I'm fortunate enough to have all that uh, the, the the old school lines, and just kind of health tested and and just temperament tested, and and just really good good bloodline, good stock. You know, how would you compare the temperament between the male and the female? <laughs> You know, it varies bloodlines, I would imagine, um, same with dogs, but in general, like for mine, for example, you know, um, I, exp- you know, you can get them similar, but in general, the male, I like to tell people sometimes will be a little bit more, um, you know, maybe wander off a little bit more, a little bit more independent. And this isn't always the case, but in general, right? And if I tell someone that's just, they want a buddy to just pack around with 24-7 or a family, you know, um, a female seems to be a little bit more, and maybe it's the motherly instinct in them, I don't know, but a little bit more... um, you know, keep dibs on you, keep check on you, you know, you can just kind of tell, uh, but, but they can also get a little bit more jealous, uh, at times too, I found. So, you know, if you have more than one, you know, if I'm petting on one of my females and, oh, good girl, and just, you know, whatever, and I got an, another one out, then I usually won't, won't do that as much, show a lot of affection because the other female will kind of hold a grudge towards her. Like they, they, they pick up on that. They're smart animals, you know, mm. and, uh, but, but yeah, um, generally that the males uh, tend to be a little bit more independent, maybe, and then the females um, seem a little bit more uh, personable. And again, it, it varies, and you can you can train them to do a lot. But that's that's kind of what I've noticed. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and early on, I used to. I used to select, well, because I mean, I was young too, and you know, you have the high strung, I guess I would use. They were real high strung. You could get some that were just just wild, you know, I don't know, just 
batshit crazy, like people say, right? Mm. And they would just bounce off the walls, and they were fun, but they couldn't settle down, you know, like even inside, they just real destructive and it got kind of annoying. Uh, and I, I just, just started working and selecting and trying to select for, you know, a, a more calmer, uh, dog that was able to, uh, and, and I, I tell this to a lot of people and, and, and jokingly, but in, in a seriousness, um, you want one that's, you know, smart enough to know what you're asking of it, but dumb enough to do it every single time, you know, and, right. and it, it, you know, it is, what it is, it, it, but that has a lot to it. You know, the, the mindset of the dog, the temperament, you know, they need to be willing to, to obey and, and do what you, um, and, and mind you, not when they're only on a leash or when you have just a treat in your pocket. Right. But uh, you you want them intelligent enough to keep you know carry out the commands and know what you're trying to ask of them as well. But uh, but yeah, these dogs that were still had an on and off switch is what I like to say. The other ones had broken switches. You know, they were still able to do every job the the ones I had early on had. But maybe um, you know, and now they could actually come in and sit by the couch and not try to eat it. You know, or tear out of their crate or, or whatever. And then occasionally you might get get something like that but um in general i want more of a, a middle of the road you know uh type dog you know there's some you can get that maybe a little bit more forward thinking you know you have what i like to say some of them uh, react maybe more and some of them sit there and, and think a problem out a little bit better and, and again it depends on what what you want it for and what your job is um and then what as far as breeding what are you trying to get from the litter? You know, and that, that does a lot of my selection, why I'm doing this breeding. It's not because of this pedigree and that pedigree, or it's not because of this color and that color. It's what do I want out of this? And these two things complement this, you know, these are the two things they both have. So let me try to get that back out. Or maybe I want to improve something on one. It's a little shy or it's a little, you know, too much you know a little high strong so i want to adjust that so it's kind of a, a constant balancing act um mm. but yeah i see what you mean when it comes to breeding what are your favorite methods line breeding and breeding out crossing etc you know it depends on the bloodline but uh, what's what's working for me and and i like the line breed and and uh Inbreed when I have a proven when I when I've proved out a dog really well and by that I mean just like some dogs are just good good better breeders than others you know um, uh, and and that's another thing I like you know a lot of people are trying to breed and maybe they're you know their their goal is just to have a bunch of pretty dogs in their yard which is great don't get me wrong I want my dogs to look well as good as well but they need to produce well. And, and for me, that's important. And I've had pretty dogs that just didn't produce. And maybe it was the blood that I'm, I'm you know, it was too tight or if it, if it was just too loose or whatever, they needed an outcross or maybe the, it, they just didn't have the right pairing. But, uh, but so that plays a, an important part. But right now, my blood really is, is meshing well. Uh, and, and my formula right now seems to be more like I, I like to do, um, I've done half brother, half sisters, you know, more line breeding. Uh, uh, my favorite probably, I've had the best luck out of is like maybe grandfather to granddaughter. Mm. Uh, and again, it depends on the percentage of the bloodline, you know, um, if it's, you know, uh, Porter Intrepid, you know, a little bit more of my stuff, um, it, the combination and stuff. But in general, yeah, I think it's important to line breed. You got to. And, and inbreeding uh, occasionally uh, as well, you know, I've, I've done that a few times when the dog is just a solid dog and, and uh, it, it's worked out great. I got... I have one female, uh, Dina, that's uh, inbred off of my male Gus, and she's just great. And I uh, recently had a litter with her, and it's just outstanding. I, I'm super happy. She's even a, a better producer, which I was uh, curious about, you know. Um, but, yeah, so that's uh, – and, and it, of course, again, it depends. If you know what you're doing, um, I, I like to go tighter. I like I, – I like, more inbreeding and, and close line breeding is, is works for me. If not, especially in this blood, you're going to get the consistency is going to, you're going to just lose it, you know? And again, and it depends too. If I'm going to do an outcross, um, 
I might. Um, I, I'm going to line breeze say on temperament. So the outcross needs to be the temperament needs to be spot on. Everything else needs to check out. Like if I can get it, the, the phenotype, the genotype, all that stuff. I, I try to get the phenotype to look and, and, and match as well. And, and so as many things you can line up on an outcross, the better. You know, you really don't want to just totally change unless you want to just change your dog but uh you know you got to know uh what the strengths and the weaknesses of, of, of each dog and they all got you know they all got one or, or two weaknesses i don't care what people say and, and if you don't then those are the ones you want to inbreed to or line breed to you know and again it also plays an important part of how tight that dog is you want to inbreed on or line breed on for example if the dog's already inbred you know, uh, uh, you might, I, I might be a little bit more hesitant to, to inbreed on it, but I might be um, more likely to do a half brother, half sister breeding, you know, a tighter line, line breeding, if, if that makes sense. Sure. Yeah. And if it has a low coefficiency, then I'll, I'll, I'll be more likely to do an inbreeding on it, you know, or take it right back to something. Right. So when you have a litter of pups on the ground, when. And how do you select what you want to keep? You know, it, it's it's hard, and I get a lot of people asking for certain things. You know, they I want a dog 36 pounds, and I want them, you know, 15 and a half inches or 16 inches tall, and I want good ears, and I want a, a good top line and, and good feet and this and that. And, and for me, it's kind of, I mean, I tell them, you might want to just go buy an adult dog. Because that's what you're going to know. It's always going to be a gamble. You know, uh, you don't know. I mean, if <laughs> that's why people have been breeding for, for thousands of years, you know, because you really, it's hard. Now, saying that, I know my bloodline enough. I've seen, I, I've, I've experienced enough in my own blood that I can give you a really good educated guess. Like, this is probably what's going to happen. And what's unique about it is I kind of <laughs> hit on... <laughs> ancestors within the litter and, and it sounds crazy probably but maybe some some guys out there can agree other breeders i will look and i'll see oh that looks like the, the grandmother in it like i will remember when they were in the whelpin box certain characteristics certain things they did you know just even even look you know uh i think it plays an important part and uh i've had you know if if the mother i remember was kind of more of the quiet pup in the corner or maybe more rambunctious and i have that one puppy in the letter litter and that kind of kind of makes me uh select that dog but you know nine times out of ten it's usually it's just kind of a crap shoot it's it's a roll of the dice uh and i kind of say okay this one seems to be uh taken to me a little bit more and uh kind of reminds me of you know the uncle you know from the litter or whatever and i like that dog and so i'll roll the dice on it and and if it doesn't work out then I'll find it a pet home, you know, or whatever, if it doesn't do everything I need it to do. Um, but, but in general, you know, I've been pretty spot on lately, especially, uh, with selecting and maybe it's been lucky or maybe just, I, I've gotten, you know, higher percentages of really good pups out of all of them. They're, they're kind of, uh, you can't go wrong with any of them, but, uh, I've been fortunate to get, um, the, the, exactly what I was looking for out of the, you know, the last few litters that I've done. Okay. Yeah, and I try to, you know, I have a farm, so I evaluate them constantly, and, and it's it's uh, it's fun for me, but, you know, I'll see what they interact with horses, you know, what they, first time they're outside, you know, I, um, I see, you know, I'll mow the grass or, you know, have the tractor and stuff. You know, I don't scare them by no means, but I'm always constantly watching them, maybe out in a little pen that I've set up and stuff, and just watching their interactions and see you know how they they uh react to certain things that they've just experienced for the first time you know and and, and see um you know and that kind of helps point me in the right direction a lot of a lot of times people will just pick maybe the, the most wildest one in the bunch but again it, it goes back to the bloodline if if the bloodline is you know, if, if the, the parents were like that, then I would say go for it. But if they weren't, then you just have to be careful because I've seen a lot of those fizzle out, sizzle out you know, mm -hmm. like I'll have or vice versa. You know, I'll have um, 
you know, the calm dog, uh, someone, you know, that looks calm or whatever. And I know the parents and I know well, how that they, they were like that as well. And they're just, um, wild, you know, as they get older and stuff. So you really have to, you know, be careful on selecting. But as far as my bloodline, yeah, I kind of just, um, I kind of evaluate them and, and I try to pick on dogs that I like that's behind those dogs. And I'm fortunate enough, you know, eight, to uh, maybe even more generations back i've i've held and fed and and you know handled all these dogs so i know if they if they peed when they ran up on you or if they flipped on their back or if they knocked your, your legs out from underneath you you know so mm. i gotta and i've seen them in welpen boxes so i know um how they acted and all those little indications you know which is it's nice i see a lot of times people don't want to you know i'm a nice guy too but i've had People tell me, I want this puppy, you know, because of this patch or because of this color or whatever. And like, well, no, you, you said you have an apartment and you want it in your apartment and, and you're not very experienced with this stuff breed and blah, 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 blah. And I said, this one's just going to be a little bit, this is going to be high strung litter, you know, this dog in general too. And they get it. And then yeah, this is early on. I don't do this no more. And then suddenly the dog gets returned. It's too much. And they're telling their, their friends, they're terrible dogs, you know, and blah, 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 blah. And reality is they should have listened to me or, or vice versa. I want a weight pull dog. I want it to do this, you know, job, blah, blah, blah. Then they come and they're like, oh, but I want that little one right over there in the corner, you know, or I want, I'm like, no, nah, that one's going to be better for more of a laid back family. You know, it's, it's not going to be, you know, it's going to be more of a thinker, not a reactor, you know, all this stuff. And then they get it and all they can tell you is, oh, they're crappy dogs because they didn't pull this weight. And, they, and I've told them, you know, that wasn't the one for you. They don't. And so, you know, just my, I think a lot of people need to just listen to the breeders if they know their dogs, you know. But now I, I try to, I, if somebody, you know, I between me and my brothers and family, I try to can keep as many as I can and raise them up and see how, how it works. But I can't keep all of them, so I do, you know, um, find good owners for them, you know, and and, and have a few uh, available uh, from pe for people. And I tell them, you know, let me know what you're looking for. If I have that, I'll, I'll let you know, and you can, you know, uh, be able to get one. And uh, that's kind of how I how I do it. You know, a lot of people, I want to pick or let me know, and I'll come and or, or they'll see a, a short video of maybe. The one beating up its brothers and sisters over there and say, oh, that's the one I want for, you know, agility or this sport or whatever it is they're, they're doing. And that one's been the laziest puppy forever. And the one little clip I posted on Facebook, he's looking like the tough guy, you know, and uh, and again, they don't, you know, they don't want to take my word for it. And it's like, man, that that's not the you need to. I would recommend one of these other two, you know, so um, right. it's it, it just varies. <clears throat> Does the Staffy Bull have good protection instincts? You know, I don't. I'm against it because I'm in. I'm in. You know, I, I've always been around the, the pit bull breed, and and this, and I've seen what these dogs are capable of. You know, on hogs and stuff like that. So, but um, I've heard of some. You know, people being. If I guess if you knew what you were doing, it would be fine. I. Uh, to me, you know, they're liable to get in the car with you. You know, you can load up all their puppies and the mama will get in the car with you and take off, you know. So they're not – now, they will alert you. Like, uh, they're quiet dogs, and that's what, what I like. Uh, by that, I mean they're not – they don't just yap to be yapping. Um so that you know like if my vehicle pulls in the yard they don't make a sound but if it's a different vehicle they know and they'll kind of let me know mm -hmm. and so in that aspect of it that's great you know or i assume if someone come to the door they would know you know they come over to it and they, they let me know um but as far as you know actual like um attack work or something like that there's people doing it with them but uh i just don't i think there's better dogs suited for it if that makes sense bigger mm -hmm. dogs uh just more uh maybe i don't know uh more of a handle and stuff and i had a, a, a friend get one of my dogs uh he does a lot of that and he has this average bull terrier that he's done very good with and uh in the french ring and stuff like that but the one he had gotten from me um 
just he said she wasn't cut out for it you know she just didn't uh she did what he told her but she just didn't have it in her to really enjoy it and love it and and i you know, for me, I think that's a good thing. I tell myself, okay, well, good. That means they're just, they're into humans so much. They just didn't see that game fun that they're playing with them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, I think you can, but yeah, in general, I just, I think there's too many other breeds to, you'd spend a lot less time, uh, and energy trying to get them to do exactly what you want, uh, than trying to, you know, mess with establishable terrier and that, that's aspect of it. But no, I've heard of, I mean, I, there has been some that are more people aggressive. Again, I don't think you'd want that. You know, I've I've heard stories and stuff. But uh, again, even I think the the gentlemen that that work in that type of field, they don't want one that's actual. You know, have human aggression. It's more of um, you know, you just want a real confident dog, with a lot of control, which they sound like they would be perfect for it. But again. My thinking is the pit bull has already got such a bad reputation. The Stavisher Bull Terrier, you know, you have these ignorant people out here that see one taking a hold of a man's sleeve arm, and it's suddenly it's, oh, my goodness, they're attacking a person, you know, and it's just something else for uh, the ASPCA to come and take your dogs away for, you know. So I, I just stay away. I got guns for that, you know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need my dog to do that. Right. How many dogs do you have now? Um, uh, you know, between my my brothers and everything, uh, and, and family, um, I probably have about twenty. Uh, not all at, at my place, but uh, just um, you know, amongst all of us. I gotcha. So yeah. going going back to feeding, um, you mentioned it before, but what exactly are you feeding now? You know, right now, um. I feed for health, you know, and I, I, in general, I like, and and I get that at Tractor Supply. Uh, Price of dog food has been ridiculous lately, man. Um, Mm. And I feed that in in general, but I was feeding, uh, and all my pups get Taste of the Wild. Mm. Um, I was feeding Taste of the Wild for all of them, but it's just gotten so, so expensive. Um, I think, (laughs) in general, just a, a decent quality uh, kibble food it, uh, works good for them. Um, I prefer more of a fish-based diet uh, for them. I just think, you know, I see the dogs at the Iditarod and all that stuff. They do really well on fish. Fish in general is something that even in the wild they would get. And um, I come from, you know, more of a nutrition type background. Um, so, like even in just fitness and stuff uh a fish protein it's just easier to digest it's it's lighter on the stomach it just makes a lot of sense has good fats you know fatty acids oils and stuff like that in it uh so yeah that's what i've i've been feeding Mm. okay do you supplement i I don't do raw i mean if people if you have time to do it and, and you know but my my thinking is you know, and I've seen it early on. There, there's some. There was a breeder out there around here. I remember would say um, that would make people sign contracts that you would only feed, you know, raw feed to your if you got a puppy from them. And I know the reason because I knew the bloodline had really bad skin issues. You know, mm-hmm. and uh, for me, I want to see it if if it can't survive off a of kibble and I'm having all these problems, then if I say you get a dog from me, I can't hold your hand and say, oh, you got to feed it raw and you got to do this and you, or you got to feed it this diet or that diet. Uh, you know, if you want to go above and beyond and make it a gourmet meal and, and, and raw and this and that, then that's fine. But my job as a breeder should make a dog that is tough as nails that will survive on the minimalist stuff, you know, in general and anything better should only enhance it and only improve it you know right it's like setting the low bar higher exactly yeah so do you use any kind of supplements you know i don't uh I, I really just feed, you know, feed dog food and stuff. I mean, just the kibble. Um, I, I've messed around with it a little bit in the past, but to be honest with you, I've, I've seen more problems with it. Like, you, you have to really know exactly what you're doing. I mean, it's 2024. The, the dog food industries, you got to trust somebody. I know they screw us so much on everything else, but in general, you know, uh, they have a lot of good. You know, so, 
you know, again, I worked in animal hospitals. So you got to think. Now, the veterinarians, they'll tell you, they are hardcore. They're against raw, a lot of them. Uh, they are preached, you know, from vet school, Perina, 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 you know. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, I have a lot of friends that are veterinarians. and But a lot of the stuff they say makes a lot of sense. They're like... All of it's formulated. They know exactly how much vitamins and minerals the dogs need in the dog food. You know, you can always give more if you need to, but you really need to be a nutritionist if you're going to mess around. You can't just feed them raw chicken every single day. I know a lot of people mix kibble in with raw, which is a smart idea. But, um, but yeah, no, I, I don't do any supplements. Occasionally, I, I w- I'll do, I've done it before. I didn't this winter, but I'll put them on like a coconut oil. <laughs> just to give them a little bit more fat uh, for winter. But what I, I did this year, and I've done this in the past as well, I'll just put them on a puppy food for winter to keep weight on them, or I'll mix it 50-50. I'll put them on adult, and I'll, I'll just get a higher fat content, uh, you know, um, dog food and try to s- switch them to that. Um, and it seems to do do well. Do you feed pregnant and whelping females differently? I don't, you know, and again, I, I'm, I'm weird on that too. I think biggest mistake people make when they're whelping uh, females is they change their diet up too much. I know some people give them beef liver and all this stuff, which is, um, you know, I, I mean, it makes sense, but, uh, I've been doing it, uh, for a while and I've had a lot of problems early on as a as a young guy I followed everything like that back in the day and, and I just had weird things happen like I had a lot of my first three litters didn't make it you know I probably should have stopped then you know but I just you know it wasn't about that for me I just kept pursuing and trying to learn and so early on I, I had you know a lot of uh yeah, my ham staff had an enlarged heart and had problems. So I seen a lot of health issues and a lot of weird stuff happen to where I was always mindful of it when I started my breeding program and, and, and even to this day. But yeah, you know, no, I keep them the same. And I think overfeeding is the worst you can do. Just like, you know, humans, man, we, we don't, a, a woman trying to give birth to, to a, a child overweight even, it's going to be harder, more taxing on their body. So it's an important to keep or calorie intake. Now you can increase it a little bit, maybe towards the last two weeks. I might add a little bit more calories to them, but I'm constantly, and every dog's different. I'm constantly evaluating the dog's looks, you know, and seeing, but, uh, I don't, sw- you know, my veterinarian and stuff was, Oh, he's switching the, the puppy food and do this and stuff too. Even I had a lot of, you know, uh, complications. I had, had c-sections for a few and again they didn't make it and and i i just called them for my program because i felt it was not what i'd done maybe it was just the bloodline so i'd gotten rid of a few dogs from that now i'm looking to think maybe it had something to do with the diet and you know a puppy's a little bit too big to even pass and and a lot of other things so no um i keep it about the same for the parent or for the mother all year now once she's whelped them and she's nursing, that's when I'll, I'll go up on the food. And I go up a little each week because they'll, they will suck her dry literally and just, you know, uh, take all of her nutrition. So that's when I change it up. I'll put them on puppy food and I'll, I'll increase the calories. And I'll go from, and just for, you know, explaining uh, purposes, let's say I'm giving a cup a day, right? So as, as soon as they go, um, you know, maybe the next week it's a cup and a half maybe then it goes to two cups a cup and a quarter then it goes you know from two feedings to three feedings you know and then from three feedings maybe even to four it depends on the litter size and it depends on the mother's metabolism some have higher metabolisms than others okay yeah and and just maybe because it's the smaller breed and stuff too you just have to be mindful of it and my experience is the ones that are in good shape and that stay consistent and, and maybe it's just superstitious and it's just the way it's happened you know it's not it's from me calling the ones that had problems early on but i haven't had any issues since i started just keeping their food consistent you know if they're healthy weight when i go into being when they're bred i keep them on the same feed up until maybe two weeks before and then what i'll do because they'll get uncomfortable is i'll split i feed once a day and so from there i'll, I'll split it to maybe twice a day and uh, the same amount of food just twice a day you know so that it's not as uncomfortable for them on their stomach. And I might add maybe just a handful, a little bit more, you know, when I know, because my thinking is I don't want, and I'm no doctor or nothing, so don't hold me to it. But 
if the pups grow too big too, you're going to have issues, right? And then if the mother gets too much weight, I've had them fat and stuff, it's going to be just harder for them to, to for labor and to turn around, bend, and get where they need to be to help. And I don't help with my pups or anything like that either. I know a lot of people are sitting there, you know, the whole – step of the way I, I let my mothers do their thing they seem to enjoy it occasionally i'll have some that they seem to really enjoy my company you know there as i gotten uh over the years as i gotten older i've i've noticed that before i'd kind of just give them more privacy and it just depends on them but uh yeah they, they do it's kind of you know their time they enjoy it it's you know as far as being a mother and stuff they're just good mothers that they're they're wonderful and they're able to whelp on their own with with uh you know, with with no problems. Every now and then, you might have some freak thing happen, but in general, uh, that's that's an important part of the breed. That now a lot of them is just schedule C sections, or you know, but you know, I don't know. Maybe they're feeding them too much. Maybe I don't know what's going on, but that's something to consider. Uh, I, I keep my feed constant, maybe until like I guess at the last two weeks. What is your uh, what does your setup look like? Mine, I have, uh, you know. Um, I have like outdoor runs, you know, uh, five by 10 kennels. Um, and I have dividers in between so they can't see each other to, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, females in heat or something and they kind of pop off at each other or whatever. So, uh, and then I have, um, uh, a, like a storage shed area, I guess that they can kind of go inside and get out of the weather and stuff that I have, um, you know, dog houses for them and stuff. So they can kind of come in and out as they want. And then, you know, I have um, about five acres here. So I let them roam, you know, in the afternoons and stuff, I let them go. And they, they uh, maybe a pair, male and a female or something like that. And they kind of roam or throughout the day, let them kind of wander and do their thing and stuff. And, uh, and then, you know, uh, catch them up and put them up at night or have the ones, you know, inside rotate or, or whatever it is. I gotcha. Yeah. <clears throat> so what are what are your plans? What's your vision for the future? You know, just kind of my, my plan is to kind of maybe consolidate some of my dogs, my bloodline. I, I have what I I've been able to I, I've managed to get uh, the type that I'm looking for, you know, as far as the, the, uh, the size, the, the confirmation and everything like that. So I kind of want to just consolidate it maybe a little bit more um, and, and focus on, focus on that, if that makes sense. Um, I, you know, I, I mean, I got a lot, a lot of dogs right now, and I got some older ones, I guess. So, so my thing is to try to get these older ones maybe bred or something off of them, you know, line bred on them now. Uh, so when you know it, when they do get too old or when they pass on or whatever, then I have it something to carry on their their legacy with. Right. Okay. And, and I guess kind of focus more. I've noticed the bloodlines are kind of disappearing a little bit. So it, it's, I have a couple that I want to tighten up on maybe as far as the, the blood, uh, just to kind of maybe preserve that side of it, if that makes sense. Sure. So what advice would you give somebody wanting to get into the Staffy Bull? I guess the best advice is just to, to do your research and to um, be hesitant of the person first person that says hey i got a pup for you you know um it's real easy to get caught up with people desperate to sell puppies you know they'll tell you anything so uh be mindful of that and and it maybe you know and then a lot of times it's it's the people that you know where can i get a puppy from and they're volunteering information um it's you know make sure you do your own research too because it's the ones that are trying to sell their puppies more so that maybe uh is there's a reason they can't sell them in the first place you know where there's some people that you know i tell people just kind of talk to me i don't i don't sell pup puppies to the public i have that on my website but saying that you know reach out to me uh, because I do have people that that are serious enough to kind of reach out to me and the reason I do that is try to also, you know, see how I just don't want anybody coming to me. You know, they need to be experienced and they need to know exactly what they want. But uh, it's kind of like that. Do, do your homework and, and see. Um, make sure, you know, 
it fits your lifestyle. Make sure uh, you're aware of, of there can be dog aggression and, and just don't be ignorant of that and, and be a responsible owner. And they're great dogs, man. They can do it all. 